This morning, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 31. Almost the whole chapter, but not quite. <clears throat> in a very interesting, although not isolated event in the... Um, well, during the time when the apostles were sent out to bring the gospel to the Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire, how the Lord was with them to help them get this work done, and how the Lord, as we've already seen, has promised us that same help as, um, well, to everyone who believes on him, as we saw in our meditation. Let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And again, this takes place after the healing of the lame man. Um, it says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came about on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in, in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. When they had ordered them to go aside out of the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man uh, was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal 
and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. May he use it as a means to encourage us to seek after his blessing of the Spirit that we might be able to do the things that his disciples did. Now, as you know, we've been looking at the subject of revival. And we've seen that one reason the Lord sends revival is to gather his people together, those for whom the Lord laid down his life. Another is to subdue his enemies. Both of these things are rewards for his work. And both of them are promoted by revival. Both of them are promoted by the work of the Holy Spirit being poured out. I mean, just consider what we saw during the Great Awakening and consider whether or not that statement is true. In revival, the Lord gives more of his Holy Spirit. He does what he always does, but he does more more of it. He awakens those who are comfortable in their sins. He makes them afraid through the threatenings of the law so that they see their condition. They know of their need of the Savior. And he converts some of these, again, who are awakened by giving them the ability to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God is really the one who takes the truth and brings it home, who makes it appear to be real. I mean, to appear what it really is. It is real. But the problem is people don't perceive it as real. So he's the one who awakens. He's the one who converts. He's the one who gives life. And he is the one who strengthens his people to do the work. And, and the way he does that, of course, is by helping them to see the reality of these things. You know how it is when we study church history, when we study again, the, the Word of God, how the veil seems to be pulled back, at least during the time when we're focusing on it. But it seems like after the, the service is done or after the message is over, the veil just goes, you know, the, the drapes close again. And we tend to just forget about it and move on to other things. We need the Spirit of God to keep our eyes open. During revival, that's exactly what He does. But, of course, revival is not just a great outpouring of the Spirit on uh, society as a whole at one time. Revival can also have to do with us personally. And that's really what we want to deal with this morning is that question, what can we do to promote personal revival? Well, I think our text gives us some direction. Now, certainly this takes place during a time of revival. Uh, Jesus had already ascended, and before he did, he gave his disciples a command, and he gave them a promise. The command was, wait in Jerusalem. And the promise was, until I pour out that which the Father is to give you, that blessing of the Spirit, that reward for Jesus' work. And when the Spirit of God was poured out, to, as you recall, on the day of Pentecost, they immediately began to speak in different languages. They began to speak the wonderful thing, the wonderful works of God. Basically, in the languages of all the people, they began to evangelize. Now, you know that charismatics make a great deal over the fact that they spoke in tongues. And it seems like that's what the charismatics want to do. They all want to speak in tongues. But they don't seem to pay attention to what the purpose of these tongues actually was. And that was to get the word of God out, to be assigned to unbelieving Israel of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And that's exactly what they saw, wasn't it? Because on that day, 3,000 of them were converted. This was a time of revival. But notice as well that even though it was, there was still something the apostles needed to do to receive more of the Spirit's work and of his help. We see that after Peter and John healed the lame man and preached and thousands of people were converted, they were arrested and brought before the council. The council told them they didn't want them any longer to teach or preach in the name of Jesus Christ. But they refused because God had commanded them otherwise. After the council threatened and released them, 
they went back where the other disciples were and they prayed. They realized that these leaders were actually standing against God, even as God said that they would from Psalm 2. But they acknowledged that God was the one who was in control. He was the one who had the power to tell them what to do and the power to accomplish it. And so they prayed that God would give them ability, give them the ability to do what he had commanded them to do, that the Lord would grant them confidence to preach the word of God and that he would extend his arm to save, that he would send the power that was needed in order to accomplish his work. And the Lord heard and he answered. And when they had finished praying, the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak not in tongues, at least not in foreign tongues, but in the language they understood the word of God with boldness and many more were saved. Now what does this text tell you and me about what we can do in order to promote revival? Well, it tells us that we can pray that God would send his Holy Spirit to revive us so that we would be able to speak the word of God boldly, that we would be able to get out there with the gospel and tell other people and in this way advance the kingdom. And that's really what we want to look at this morning, two, two main things. That there is something that you can do, there's something that I can do to promote revival. We can pray, and we can also, in the strength God gives us through our prayers, reach out to other people with the gospel. It's important that we have the Spirit of God in us to be able to witness in a way that's going to bring other people to Christ. So first of all, this text tells you that you don't have to sit around and wait for worldwide revival or societal revival for the Lord to pour his spirit out in mass upon mankind for God's work to move forward through you. You can do something. You can pray. Now, first of all, you can pray that God would give you the desire to do this work, to move it forward. Because you know as well as I do, unless you really want something, unless you want it bad enough, you're not going to get it. It's not going to be accomplished. When you want something really badly, you really can't stop thinking about it and working towards it until you actually get it. Well, that is how much you must want God's kingdom to move forward. If you don't want it to move forward in that way, you're really not going to accomplish very much in advancing towards that goal. You have to desire it. But this desire is not something that you can work up within yourself. It's, it's not in there by nature. It's something that has to come down from God. Now, if you were born again, if you are a believer, you know the Spirit of God already dwells in you. And you know that you have some level of desire for the kingdom to move forward. But if that desire isn't strong enough, you need more of God's spirit. So you need to pray and ask him for more of his spirit. Now the question is, is God going to answer your prayer? Is he going to give you what you're asking for? The answer to that question is yes. The Lord will do it because he commands you to be filled with the Spirit of God. That is a state or condition that you and I are to be in at all times. You can pray for this blessing knowing that God will give it to you because this is his will. So now the question is, will you pray this prayer? Well, you will if you want the Spirit of God. You will if you realize that you don't have enough of his influence in your life. And how can you really tell whether or not you do? Well, again, ask yourself the question, how do you measure up to the example that Jesus Christ actually left you? How much like him are you? When you begin to live like Jesus lived, when you begin to love like Jesus loved, when you begin to make the sacrifices Jesus would make, and when you, are, 
really basically have a heart for the Father's work the way that he did. When you're reaching out to others with the same kind of compassion that Jesus reached out to the lost, then you will have all of the spirit that you need. But until then, you need to pray and ask that God would grant to you of his Holy Spirit, more of his Holy Spirit. Now, at the same time, you also need to guard what the Lord has given to you already. You realize that every time you use the means of grace and every time you pray, God gives you some influence by his Holy Spirit. But every time you sin, you lose something of that influence of the Holy Spirit. He can be lost, at least his influence can be through sin. Thankfully, he will never be severed from your soul because when the Lord saves, he saves permanently. But he can be lost, his influence can be lost by sin, by doing things you shouldn't be doing, by giving your time and your affections to the world or giving them to yourself in order to glorify yourself. When you give things to these other things, really, that you should be giving to God, your heart, your time, your service. And of course, by not doing what the Lord commands. Every time you see something that you know God wants you to do and you don't do it, then you're sinning against the Lord. And when you do things you shouldn't and don't do things you should, when you sin, when you resist the Spirit of God, you grieve Him. I mean, he is a person, and he responds to the things that you do. He either approves of what you do, or he disapproves. And every time he disapproves, when you do something he disapproves of, that grieves him. And when you grieve him, that quenches his work, and you lose something of that power. Again, as I thought about this during the week, I remembered what Susanna Wesley had said to her sons, and so I dug up this quote. Thankfully, we have the internet to find it easily. She said this, whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish, your desire, or your enjoyment for spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of your body over the mind that is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. Now, you, you realize that what she's saying here is to her sons that you need to think about how the things you do actually affect you spiritually. And if you do something, whatever it is that causes you to grow weaker spiritually and causes your flesh to grow stronger, that is sin. And it needs to be avoided. Boy, if we could just do that if we would just put that into practice, how much stronger we would be in the Lord. Because we, again, we spend so much time in the, the means of grace, or at least we should, and then we give everything we've gained away to the things that we're so used to doing in this world. We just lose it all, and then we're back to square one, and we wonder, where is the Lord? And why aren't we stronger than we are? Why aren't we more mature than we are? It's because we're giving all these things up. Remember, God tells us that everything we do should be for his glory. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if you are doing everything you do to the glory of God, the spirit of God will not grow weaker. He will not be quenched. He will not be grieved. But he will grow stronger with each step that you take. His influence in you will be stronger. If you're really doing this, what, what Paul commands us to do, what the Lord tells us to do through Paul, then you won't be giving up anything but gaining with each step you take. So remember that we need to use the means of grace, but we also need to be careful not to lose what we gain through our sins. We need to repent and follow the Lord. So if you would be revived, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God which means you must not only use the means of grace that God has given to you in order to gain the Spirit of God, but you have to keep from sinning. You have to repent of all your sins because sin is like pouring water on the fire that the Spirit of God is trying to kindle in your soul. Every time you sin, you're dousing that flame and making it weaker. But every time you do something for the glory of God, 
it grows stronger. And when you're filled with the Spirit of God, there is nothing that you are going to want more than that his kingdom would advance. And so pray first that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit and guard what he gives you. Don't lose it by giving it away to the world, by giving it away to sin. You're not going to go anywhere if that's the case. You're just going to be stagnant. You're going to be static. You're not going to be able to move ahead. So the first thing is be revived yourself. Secondly, pray for your brothers and your sisters in the Lord that they too might be filled. Now, maybe you're doing what you need to be doing, but maybe they're not. Well, they need your help. They need for you to pray for them. We need to be praying for one another. Now, will the Lord answer your prayers if you are actually in this condition, revived? Well, the Lord says he will. Because if your life is filled with, your, with his spirit, you will be living in a way that is pleasing to him. And if you are living in a way that is pleasing to him, he will hear your prayers. What does James mean when he writes this? The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Does he mean that any believer can pray and it's going to accomplish a great deal? Well, certainly every believer has a promise that if he asks for certain things with the right kind of heart in the name of Jesus for what God commands, he's going to give that to you. But what if you don't desire it for the right reasons? What if you're not seeking after these things for God's glory but for your own? What if you're not really living the kind of life God wants you to live? Doesn't that hinder your prayers to the Lord? It does. But if you are living for him and if you are filled with the Spirit and the desire for his glory... The Lord says when you pray, your prayers will be effective. God will hear you, which means he will hear your prayers on behalf of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So if you are revived, you need to pray. You need to pray that the Lord would revive the particular fellowship of which you're a part. You need to pray that he would revive his church more broadly, that is in the city, throughout the state, and throughout this country, and of course throughout the world. You need to pray that God would raise his people up, that he would revive them and raise them up as an army and that he would equip us with the truth and with the boldness that we need to proclaim the gospel. So you need to pray that the Lord would move his kingdom forward through his people. You need to pray for one another. Now, not only do you need to be revived so that you can pray for others, but there's a third thing you can do. You can gather with God's people to pray because when God's people are revived, that's exactly what they're going to want to do. Notice that uh, Peter and John, after they had been threatened and released, didn't just uh, go to their individual prayer closets to pray by themselves. And they didn't just gather together. You know, Peter says to John, John, why don't, we just, you know, why don't we just agree together right now and we'll pray and ask for the Lord's blessing. But they went back to the disciples by the way, there's nothing wrong with those other two things, but they went beyond that. They went back to the disciples. They told them what happened. They, they realized that these men were standing against the Lord's will. And so they prayed together and they sought the Lord as a body. And the Lord heard them. And the Lord literally shook that place. He sent an earthquake. And he filled them with the Spirit of God. Now, if you want revival, what should you do? Should you just, um, well, first of all, do nothing. Just wait until the Lord sends it. After all, it's sovereignly in his hands, so why do anything? No, you, you can pray. And once you're revived, should you just, is that all you can do? Is there nothing else? No, you can pray for the people of God that they might be revived. And once they're revived, what should you do? I mean, basically, everybody be revived individually and, Pray individually? No, the Lord says, get together. And he says, pray together. And as a body, enter into prayer and seek the Lord together. And as you do, the work of the Holy Spirit will increase. Now, finally, you should pray with regard to prayer that, that the Lord 
as, as he revives you and his people and so forth, pray that God would send his spirit on the lost, on those outside the church, to awaken and convict them, to convince them of their danger, and to prepare them to receive the gospel. We saw last week, if the spirit of God doesn't work, it doesn't matter what you do. Nothing is going to be accomplished as far as their salvation. They might be informed. They might think you're crazy. But they're not going to be saved. The Spirit of God has to bring it home, which is why you and I need to pray for them, because they're not going to be praying for themselves. We need to pray for them. We need to seek for their salvation, and prayer is the way that we do this. Now, again, uh, this just gets us to the point where we're ready now to do what the Lord has called us to do. Prayer is simply the prelude to the work that needs to be done. So secondly, as you pray, you need to realize that the Lord's not going to just simply fall on people out there apart from your interaction with them. You need to get out there with the gospel. Now we've seen that this work of the Spirit is so important because if he doesn't work, people aren't going to be saved. They're never going to turn away from their sins. But you need to realize the Spirit of God works through instruments. He works through particular agents. He works through you and he works through me. Now, first of all, he has to work within you to give you a heart for this work. He needs to make you a particular kind of person, one who has a conviction that these things are actually true, one who is bold enough actually to speak to other people, one who loves them and cares for them enough to reach out to them. You will not get out there and witness, and the Spirit will not do his work to convince unless you're the right kind of person. Again, the Lord works through instruments, but he works through prepared instruments, and you are those instruments as well as myself. Now again, as I mentioned before, what we do makes a difference. The kind of person we are makes a difference. There are certain things that have to be true of you before people are going to listen. You have to have this fruit that the Spirit of God is going to produce. And actually, it would be helpful for you to know what that fruit is so that when the Spirit is trying to produce it in you, you'll see it and realize he's working, and then you'll do what you need to do in order to uh, help that work along. So let me borrow just for a moment from the thoughts of J.C. Ryle, who wrote in his book, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century, regarding uh, those that the Spirit of God used in the Great Awakening in England. Let me just give you a few of the things he says. He says, first of all, they preached. That is, these men, these were the ministers. And again, we can apply this to ourselves as well in just a moment. They preached. They preached simply, fervently, directly. They spoke words of faith with faith. And the story of life they shared with life, convinced that it was true. They threw their heart and soul into it, sending their audiences home uh, at least with the impression that they believed it and that they wished them well. They spoke from the heart to the heart. Now, I think you can probably tell from these things. You've, you've known people like that. Maybe you're a person like that yourself, and you know that the way a person conveys something to you is as important as what they say. And if it doesn't look like that person is really convinced that what they're telling you is true, they're going to dismiss you as being a fool, that you, don't even, that you don't even believe it. Why should I believe it? The way you say something will make a big difference. We need to be convinced. We need to desire their salvation. We need to care about them. So basically, if you are to be faithful, if you are to be effective in your witness to the Lord, you have to have these qualities. Qualities that come not from your flesh, not from nature. It's not something you can work up in yourself, but something that comes from the fullness of the Spirit of God. I mean, just look at how the Lord transformed Peter's life. From denying Christ before these, you know, the, well, these bystanders, even servant girls, 
to standing up before these, um, before the council and boldly proclaiming the name of Christ, realizing that these men might very well kill him for it. That's quite a change. The Spirit of God can do that. And that's what we need to seek. When the Spirit of God fills you, then you can tell the gospel to other people in a way that is simple enough for them to understand it, in a fervent way that makes them pay attention to what you're saying in a direct way. Sometimes we like to beat around the bush about these things, but really, you just need to go for the heart of it and talk to them, tell them. They can tell whether or not you have faith. The Lord will give you that faith, that confidence, that assurance these things are true. And you can speak it in an animated way, not in some kind of a lifeless way. Out of that kind of conviction, throwing, as it were, your heart and your soul into it. Again, giving you a burden for the lost. Realizing, you've got to realize, this isn't just an academic exercise. If the people you're speaking with don't receive this message, if they do not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will perish forever. They will suffer for an eternity in hell. So with the Spirit's help, you can send them home at least convinced that you believe what you're saying and convinced that you really care about them and you really want them to be saved. You know, if you believe that they're in danger, even if they reject it, even if they get upset with you, it's still going to affect them. You know, people do get angry when you tell them about the gospel. Not everybody does, but a lot of people do. But just because they're getting angry doesn't mean you failed. Just because they get angry doesn't mean the Spirit of God isn't working. What really matters is what happens when they go home after they've had this emotional reaction and begin thinking about the things that you've said. Those are the parts we often don't think about, but that does happen. What we portray, the conviction we have, the faith we have, the life, the concern, the compassion for others will be a means to their conversion if we have them or will be a means for them to dismiss what we say if we don't have them. We need to be a particular kind of person to share the gospel with others. And really what we need is simply to believe it and to be concerned for other people. If we have that, we'll have everything that we need. Speak from the heart to the heart. That's the most important thing. So what have we seen this morning regarding what we can do to promote revival, what we can do as individuals? Well, first of all, you can pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for the fellowship of which you're a part. Pray for the church as a whole. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends and your neighbors. You can pray by yourself. You can pray with your family. You can pray with other believers. But especially pray with the people of God as they meet together for prayer. If you have the Spirit of God within you, you will want to do that. You can pray that God will revive your heart, that he will make you more like Jesus, that he would revive the hearts of all of his people, that he would awaken those who are spiritually dead and save them. And of course, you can begin communicating the gospel from this heart filled with the Spirit of God in a way that convinces them that you at least believe it and that shows that you care enough about them to risk what you're risking just by talking to them. That they should believe it too in order to be saved. Now again, the eyes are open, the veil is, is drawn back, at least for this period of time. The question is, what's going to happen once we say the prayer and once we move on? Are we going to remember what we've seen? Just memorize this verse. Again, that's one of the reasons why we memorize uh, the verses we're, we are working on is so that we won't lose touch with the things we've seen. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. This was not an isolated blessing for them. This is something the Lord promises he will do for us if we are willing to seek him for this blessing. So let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask that the Lord might take this word and use it to keep our 
minds and our hearts open to what the Lord wants us to do and, and that he might actually help us apply it so that our lives would be changed.